This is Surviving and Thriving with a Substitute, a guide to missing work when you need to. So I really appreciate uh, being invited uh, to do this. When I got the email um, and they were asking me to choose a topic, um, I was trying to think of what would um, be most helpful and something that's sort of a passion project for me. And um, I think maybe sub plans is sort of like not the intuitive first thing, you know, like a lot of people are really passionate about choice or um, they're passionate about using technology in their classroom. Um, but for sure, this is mine. I'm Lindsay Moss and I teach in Yorkville, Illinois. Um, for the Yorkville School District. I've been here my whole career um, for 16 years. I went to NIU for my undergrad. Um, I teach at Grand Reserve Elementary School. I'm a K-6 art teacher. My caseload's about 600 kids. And I also have a side thing. I work for the Art of Education. So if some of you um, know me from there, I used to be a writer for them. And um, now I help with their professional development platform. So some of these ideas have come up in the Art of Ed, and I presented on this topic for them too. But tonight, um, in case you are also an Art of Ed viewer, I, it's new stuff. So everything should be new for you. So um, here is back to the topic, why sub plans? Um, so my personal experience has been sort of Murphy's Law. Like, um, I think when I was a new teacher, I had a lot of um, times where I would catch that bug, you know, all those germs that go around in elementary classroom. And it was like, I would just go to sick, go to work sick. Like, I think we've all experienced that before. It's like, you're weighing in your mind, like what, what would be easier here? Would it be easier if I just like, <coughs> excuse me, would it be easier if I just like drove into work, even though I felt terrible. And there were some times where I probably went to work and got kids sick when I shouldn't have. Um, and so if you already have sub plans written, I feel like it's Murphy's Law, then sometimes you aren't sick. Also, my personal mantra, I feel like it's so hard, especially as an art teacher, because this is um, our passion. It's so hard to kind of have a good work-life balance and something I'm really trying to do in my life is make teaching second and my family first. And um, one way I can do that is to miss work when my family needs me, whether that's for actual sick days or mental health days. I think it's really important to be there and totally invested in the classroom when you need to be. But when your family needs you, um, I have two daughters that actually attend the school that I work. This is Lyndon, who is nine, and as you can see, broke her arm, and we had multiple doctor's appointments this year that I had to miss work for, and Ellie, who's six and in first grade and, you know, gets respiratory stuff all the time. The other side of the coin is sometimes as a, a specials, specials teacher, um, if I have extra time in my schedule, if a friend or colleague is out sick, they will ask me to go up and sub for that class. And so that's led me to be on the other side of the coin sometimes, like substitute teaching for a content area that I don't know anything about. Like my like nightmare awful scenario that makes me like sweaty and want to die. I had to go teach fourth grade math one time and they were doing fractions and it was hellish. And it was, it was the experience of walking into a classroom and not having time to read the sub plans and not being familiar with the content kind of made me reevaluate a little bit what I leave for the subs in my classroom. And then I guess the final thing that I kind of think about that makes this my passion project also is sort of student feedback. Like I'll, there will be times where I have to go to an IEP meeting or something. So I'm actually at the building before I leave and um, my students will see me leaving out sub plans. And I'll never forget the day that somebody said, oh, you miss Moss, you can't leave. You can't have a meeting because it's my art day. And um, you know, when art is like this special time for them that they look forward to all week, and, um, and you leave a plan that um, is just to get by, you know, they know that. And um, I had some interesting conversations with kids and they were saying, yeah, you know, when you miss, it's just, 
it's it's not as fun because we know we're not going to paint or we're not going to do clay because you're not going to leave that for a sub. So keeping all these things in mind, um, I'm going to talk to you today about <coughs> about um, potential ways that you could um, kind of overcome some of these problems. So today, the three topics that I really want to dive deep into are preparing and using a sub tub which is probably um, an idea that um, you've heard of before, but I'm gonna go like a step further to make it um, art specific and um, a helpful tool that you can kind of use, not just for your sub, but just for your life. Um, I'm gonna talk about strategies that are working for me for lesson plans. And again, if you've um, heard me talk on this topic before, I've got all new stuff for you tonight. New ideas are great. Um, and then also um, tips and tricks for common sub related problems. I feel like, <clears throat> especially if you're on any of the art teacher Facebook pages, um, the sub horror stories are crazy. And I have not had um, anything that is like, you know, worthy of some of the posts I've seen online, but I have had some stuff go wrong. And um, I've had to kind of problem solve that. And so hopefully I can kind of help you with that. So um, let's start first with the sub tub. Um, so I think probably the sub tub, if you're not familiar with this idea, it's the idea that you would have a, a actual physical tub. And I use um, one that I got at Office Max that holds, you know, file folders or um, whatever in it. And you would have things already prepared in that tub for your substitute teacher in the event that you have an absence. And I think the way most people do it is they put in a series of lesson plans or resources and then they leave it um, for the sub in the event that they are, you know, actually gone. Um, but I also like to um, include a folder system in the tub. And um, I'm not even sure where I got this idea. I may have like seen this, you know, on social media or Instagram from a regular ed teacher, but it works so well for art, especially when um, I think like, you know, reg ed teachers have such an easy time leaving a sub plan because they can leave one seating chart and, you know, one set of directions about behavior plans and one set of, you know, warnings about health concerns or whatever. But for us, I mean, for me, you know, depending on the day, it could be eight or nine sets of that information. Um, so to me, a sub tub really to take the best care of your kiddos needs to be more than just the tub with the lesson plans in it. It needs to be all the info that a um, substitute really needs in order for the kids to be okay. So um, this is an actual folder out of my sub tub. And so I'm not going to flip the pages because I'm sure there's like some confidential stuff in here. Um, but basically, I do this every fall. So um, preparation is really the key here. You want to get this done early, like I mentioned Murphy's Law before. If you get this done early, like, you know, in August, you don't have to think about it the whole rest of the year. And it's the perfect time. Because in August, you are just getting all that information you need to read about your kiddos anyway. Like when I get back to school and I get um, all the medical concerns, I go through, you need to read them anyway. So I go through and then I put them in the folder for each class. So just as an overview, um, these are tabs and I just make it by, you know, printing the topic or the text line on the bottom of the page and then just chopping them. And I do sets for the whole school at once. Um, so general class info, um, health info. And like I said, I'm reading it anyway in August. So I just go through and write down what I need to Now You're going to want to check with your administration to know um, what they consider best practices to go in a sub tub. So I won't write what a kid's medical condition is, but I will write something a sub needs to know, like so-and-so's got an inhaler or um, so-and-so's highly allergic to peanuts, you know, or any specific information that you would need um, a sub to know to make sure your kid gets through the day healthy, pretty much is what I put in there. This one's really key, the behavior plans. Um, my district, I don't know if this is the case everywhere, but I feel like classroom teachers come up with a lot of different behavior plans and it's like a super challenge for um, 
specialist teachers because you have kids walk in who maybe this kid's earning a smiley or that kid's on a check mark chart or whatever it needs to be tracked. And um, those are the kids who really need extra love and support from a sub because they're used to routine. So I like to put in um, under the behavior tab what those things are so a sub, a sub can expect it and know how to help that kid best. And then finally, the last tab, um, I put in the seating chart and um, the class roster and everything. So I just staple it across the top. And then there's like a tab that says the teacher or whatever. And then I keep um, a lesson plan inside along with the paper that they're going to need. So then the sub tub has a folder for every single class. Um, and I know that this might initially sound time consuming, but like once you've done it once, it kind of, it comes down to a science. And um, it only takes maybe, I think maybe the total time investment for me at this point to do like under 30 classes is probably about three hours at the start of the school year. Um, and then all year, it's, it's very, very helpful, whether you have a planned absence or whether your kid gets sick. And of course, that never happens until like 630 in the morning when there's no time to drive to the school and do um, sub plans. This is already waiting on your desk ready for the kid. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, next, what do you put into the folder for sub plans, right? Like that's, that's the nitty gritty. Um, and like I was saying before, I feel like it's really a challenge because um, what you wanna do is come up with um, something that's going to engage the kids for sure, because <laughs> this is not based on any science, but it's my personal belief that great lessons that have high engagement eliminates behavior issues. And I know we're all like, terrified of coming back and seeing that note that there was a major behavior issue <laughs> for your substitute because nothing's worse than being sick and coming back and discovering that you now have parent phone calls to make or office referrals to write like you don't want to deal with that on top of it um so i'm going to share a ton of different strategies for how you could make um lesson plans that have that higher engagement and then hopefully that helps the sub avoid um you know any of those <coughs> potential behavior plans so um hold on one second let's find my <coughs> slide here okay so strategy that works um this is actually what i'm using next friday for iaea and in the bottom you can probably see there's like a little snapshot down here of the pdf and um I'll drop that later into the comments. So if you wanna like print it and use it for next Friday for yourself, I'm leaving it for my second graders. Um, so this first thought is the idea that you can really um, engage kids while you're gone with exciting materials. Now, I know what you're thinking. A lot of, a lot of subs that come in, you can't leave exciting materials for them because those are often like, high um, mess or high monetary investment. And, and you don't wanna put somebody who's uncomfortable with art making into this scenario where they're you know, doing clay or printmaking or something, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I would recommend looking for a way to use existing like cleaner materials in a way that really excites your kids. Um, and my current favorite right now is washable markers. So I'm trying to think of ways that I can use something that a sub's not gonna find scary, but my kids are gonna be like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. That's awesome. Um, so for example, you could go to the dollar store and get a whole stack of styrofoam plates. And um, you could leave a sub plan where kids cut out little you know, squares out of the plate and then use a pencil to draw a design in it um, impressing the design down into the styrofoam and then color on top with a washable marker and use it as a stamp on paper. That's pretty clean. Um, it's something that uses supplies that they have at home. So they may get, you know, really excited to take that idea back and work with it more. Um, or the one that um, I'm going to be doing for next Friday, which the plan is for, is for using 
um, washable markers as watercolors. Um, I've done this in small group as like a art party reward for kids and they love this. It's so simple. Um, and there are so many different ways that you could take it in terms of some review of concept while you're gone, right? But um, basically the idea is that a kids do some type of drawing and the lesson plans for a review of um, geometric or organic shapes. And they do it with like a Sharpie marker, right? And then they outline each shape with um, watercolor marker. And I don't know if you had those paint by number books when you were a kid, but that's basically what you're creating. And so um, what happens is when they get their brush wet and they go over the edges of, um, of their drawing, um, then it starts to create, um, the pigment will start to run and then it creates sort of their own watercolors. And the thing that's cool about this is I've had kids say to me like, oh, my mom like doesn't let me paint at home, but she'll let me do your marker thing, which it's a travesty that kids can't paint at home, but you're giving them a skill that they could then make their own art at home, even if they don't have those higher end supplies available to them, which I think is really cool. Um, it also kind of teaches some actual watercolor skills. Like I'm always trying to teach my kids don't put adjacent wet areas next to adjacent wet areas unless you want, you know, that that watercolor to like mix. And that really happens with these markers because of how the water goes on the paper. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be gained from a lesson like that. And my kids just like super love it. So that's what they're going to be doing at the second grade level next Friday when I'm gone. And like I said, I'll drop that into the comments later so you can check it out. Um, so then another idea is centers. Um, and I first got this idea reading an article from the Art of Ed that I think it was Alicia Eggers wrote. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't doing a lot of centers in, in my personal classroom because, you know, a lot of art making um, as individual and you always have those collaborative projects but um and i i never thought of leaving centers for a sub because centers to me felt like it was a lot to manage and so when i was doing it in my room i felt like it took a lot of energy but the thing that's interesting is that um my reg ed teacher friends centers are like a normal part of their day so a lot of substitutes are comfortable with centers. Like that's a format that they encounter in the regular ed classroom and they're really used to. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's not threatening to them to do that in your classroom as long as the centers themselves seem manageable. Um, so don't be afraid to leave something like centers that has super high engagement because kids are doing short activities and then going on to the next activity, right? Like there's not enough time for mischief because they're excited and engaged and looking to the next thing. And um, if you're really savvy about it, you can leave some centers that build good art skills that then you can reference when you get back in other projects. So um, a few ideas for centers. Um, friendly Loom, you know, like uh, I have a friendly loom in my classroom. If you don't have a friendly loom, you could use just any other type of cardboard loom or whatever. And um, to have that weaving experience, I feel like we never have enough time to use the friendly loom. And it's um, something that the kids are always excited about. So to leave out yarn and, um, you know, just warp up part of the part of the loom so that kids can work on it collaboratively in a center works great for a sub. Um, tangrams i got like a set of tangrams from um a classroom teacher who was getting rid of them and the kids just really love to like build and pattern and if you see that picture there that was like a third or fourth grader i just thought it was like the most beautiful intricate pattern that they were building just um on the fly quick center you know they've got like eight minutes to make something interesting um play-doh i think play-doh makes a great center if you give task cards because you can have them practice coil rolling like who can make the longest coil or um have them a perfect sphere who can make you know four of the same perfect sphere exactly the same size that's awesome because now they can make feet for a bowl at some point you know um so you could create task cards to go with that play-doh um so it's not just a free-for-all but it does practice skills that you're going to eventually use in your classroom 
Another one that I found my kids super love for a center is origami or paper folding. Um, and you can find all kinds of cool instructions online for different origami projects they could do. And I don't personally have money in my budget for origami paper. So I'll just, you know, um, cut old copy paper that I find in um, the workroom and um, use it that way so that it's square. Um, jewelry making, I don't mean like any type of metal smithing, the sub would kill me, right? Um, I just mean that I feel like I get a lot of donated yarn um, and donated beads, and it's a great opportunity for kids to practice fine motor or basic macrame. Um, also, I love to put out extra supplies to have them test it. Like, I feel like when I go to conferences like IAEA or NAEA or um, Art of Ed Now, you know, you get this, like, these samples of, like, one or two things, and it's kind of like, well, um, you know, what, what, it's fun to try it as an art teacher, but I don't have a class set of this, but if you put all those things out in a bin, and you're like, try these supplies, let me know what you would make out of them, um, that ends up being sort of an interesting center for kids. So if you are going to IEA next week, you should just put all that stuff that you get from the vendors in a bin and use it for a center later on. Um, yeah, so another great idea beyond centers <clears throat> is um, collaboration or competition. When I mentioned the Play-Doh, I kind of like hit on that a little bit, um, but I found that um, kids seem really engaged by one or the other and you have to know for each class what's going to work I mean we all have like a class where you know if you have a contest while you're gone they're gonna it's gonna be world war three or um or a class that's not gonna work well collaboratively like you you probably have a sense of which classes you could leave this for or not um but as far as collaboration I've had a lot of good luck leaving um, large scale projects for kids that already kind of have some parameters set by me. So like in this picture, you can see I have one friend's face blood out. That other one is my actual child. Um, someone had asked me like a PTO mom or someone had asked me to make a poster and um, I was going to be gone at a meeting. So I just kind of like drew out you know, basically where the lettering and then left it for the sub for the kids to color and create. And, you know, I know sometimes people are uncomfortable letting go of control of something that you've been asked to do by like a third party, like the PTO or whoever. But I just really think it's great when it's kid led. And if you just start doing that, um, then people know when they request a project from you that it's going to be kid made which is how it should be, right? It's their school. Um, but once people are used to that idea, they know what's coming back. And when you have a sub, um, you're not using like in your instructional time for the kids to complete that task. It's still a very worthy task for them, but they can do it while you're gone. And they're usually really invested and excited to be like, oh, Miss Moss, we finished it while you were gone. Let me show you what we did. Um, I've had some success also with large scale murals. There's uh, several of these on Teachers Pay Teachers or you can make your own where each kid has like a smaller piece of a larger hole. And so they're working collaboratively um, to complete it. Um, I think in that case, you know, sometimes kids might be uh, hurrying with their coloring, but all of a sudden, if you are one piece of something that belongs to everybody, you are really focused on your craftsmanship and putting your own spirit and your own mark on things. Um, <clears throat> another one that I have tried that works really well is create your own coloring book, um, where you come up with a particular theme and ask kids to create a black and white line drawing for the coloring book. Um, and then when you get back from subbing, you run all those through the copy machine and do the staple binding. And then that coloring book can go in your early finisher station for younger kids to use. Um, and then when kids start to see, oh, that drawing I did is in this coloring book that, and look, some kids were coloring on it. Um, then the next time you are gone, they're even more invested in a task like that. Um, so then uh, this right hand picture, you can see this, gigantic, huge, like, index card pyramid of fun. Um, Jordan DeWild, who I just love, wrote this great article on task parties um, for the Art of Ed, and I've got the link down there if you want to check it out, but um, he really got me thinking about task parties in the sense of 
um, collaboration versus competition. And I um, tried something like this at the start of the year and then left some for sub plans that worked really well. Um, basically, you take something that you have a lot of, which in my case, in this picture you can see was index cards, and then left ideas for competition. Like, okay, while I'm gone, who can make in small groups the tallest thing? Who can make the strongest thing? Um, or in the case of Plato, who can make the longest thing, right? And then you have the sub be the judge and record what the results were. You can even have a wall of fame on your board um, to kind of celebrate like who was doing awesome, right? Um, and the kids are really excited and motivated by something like that. So um, another idea, <laughs> I feel like I need to mention this even though this is not my jam. Um, I'm not an awesome tech person, as you can tell with my PowerPoint going in and out here. Um, but I know a lot of teachers who swear by flipped subplans. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this idea, it's the idea that you just film yourself. You film the instruction. And then when you're gone, the kids watch the video and then they complete the project. So the sub is really just handling the tech. Um, so I have some pictures up here on my laptop and my um, setup for my TV screen in my room, but you'll see in the bottom here is the picture of the TV screen not working. Um, this tends to be the case at my building. I feel like when I have a sub, sometimes technology is not always super reliable. Um, however, my music teacher swears by this. This is how he does all of his sub plans, so I feel like I should mention it. Um, I know there are a lot of art teachers who do this and it might be worth investigating. Um, you can also, you don't have to film yourself. You could use somebody else's video of art instruction, something like Art for Kids Hub um, or YouTube, or I know there's a lot of fabulous art teachers out there who do um, flipped sub lessons. Cassie Stevens comes to mind right off the bat, and I know she has a ton of blog posts about that. And since she also puts a lot of her videos on YouTube, you could have Cassie be your substitute teacher, right? I mean, why not? She's fabulous. Um, so another strategy beyond um, flipping lessons <laughs> is to use an unusual, unusual prompt. So like, let's say that you don't have these materials to put out for your kids, you know, or you don't have time to do the flipped lesson. Um, sometimes all it takes is a really cool prompt. Um, like, for example, you can see down here, this is a monsters versus robots drawing. And if you can think of a kid friendly drawing idea like that, sometimes that's all the sub needs to get the super high engagement. Um, you can also do a contemporary art connection. So um, for example, that's a Tara Donovan exhibit that I went to this year, which um, I kind of connected with all of those index cards. You know, Tara Donovan's making sculptures out of like large amounts of a mundane object. So you leave a large amount of mundane object, you know, if you have, I don't know, 2000 paper plates or whatever, and then ask the kids to collaboratively build something based on that. Um, also, I love doing reader response, leaving a really great book and then asking the kids to draw something based on that. Um, my favorite one currently is Drawn Together. And I am running out of time, but I have so much more to tell you. Um, 25 minutes goes fast, right? So um, really quick to, <clears throat> before we run out of time, I think we had a couple questions. Hold on. I had more comments or more um, content to share with you, but Really quick, let's look at this Q&A. Somebody's got a question. It says, oh, it's just a thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so super fast since we've got like two minutes. Um, tips and tricks for common problems because um, like I was saying before, I have not had too many um, art room catastrophes personally. Um, although I feel like I read them on a daily basis, right? Are we seeing them on like the art teacher Facebook page? Um, so a few ideas to avoid catastrophes. Um, first thing I hear, sub doesn't understand the plans. I swear by a buddy teacher. So for me, this is my music teacher and um, my ILT or librarian. Whenever one of us is sick, we have like a symbiotic relationship, we text the other, right? and then say, hey, going to have a sub today, go in and problem solve. It's that person's job to go in in the morning before school start, ask the sub directly, do you understand her plans? Did you find everything? And then if they didn't, they call or text me. And I do the same for them. 
then this doesn't get back to your administrator later that something was confusing or out of hand or wasn't right. It's like solved before 8 a.m. Um, another thing I, I hear about all the time is like expensive supplies getting ruined, like the sub misunderstands and gets out like your best oil pastels ever and then they're all ground into the floor or whatever. Um, I print out a sign that just says off limits. And if there's something I super don't want people to touch that's sitting out for the day, I physically tape it up or have the buddy teacher tape it up, right? Um, so that way things that you may not be able to store in a cabinet for whatever reason, logistical reason, don't suddenly become part of the sub free for all. Um, if you're a sub, you have a sub that hates art, try a preferred sub list. Um, at the bottom of your sub plans, leave a note. Hey, if you were cool with this today, if you like teaching art, if this wasn't so bad, could you leave your cell number for me? Um, and then start developing a list of people who either know a lot about art or are just okay with the craziness of the day and willing to do it. And then suddenly you're not all um, putting, you know, in for a blind sub. Every time you're sick, you're texting that person that you know kind of likes coming. So then there's someone there that wants to be there, which is I think three quarters of the battle. Um, and then I know I mentioned before a lot of ideas and this folder, and it seems like a lot of time would be involved in this. Um, but the secret I think is to only use sub plans for a single grade level. This has been a huge time saver for me. So, you know, I mentioned that sub plan that I'll drop in the comments that I made um, the PDF for the, the watercolor markers. I'm only going to use that with second grade next Friday. And the reason is then I know every time I'm absent from here on out that second graders have done that. And so I can use a different lesson plan for every other grade level. And then second grade next year, we'll get that same plan. So you develop a library and if you reuse them by grade level over the course of a year or two, you suddenly have like a lot of, of sub plans for each grade level. Whereas if you use a sub plan for multiple grade levels, suddenly you can't use it subsequent school years. Does that make sense? Maybe I could explain that in a confusing way. Um, and then the other secret, trade with art teacher friends. Like if you have a sub plan, whether um, you create it yourself or you got it online or whatever, if you missed and it worked out well, email all the art teacher in your district. Be like, hey, this one really worked, here you go. And then hopefully it starts a um, sharing back and forth. I know that has been going on in my district a little bit this year. We had an art teacher with, um, a kid with health concerns, which kind of got us all suddenly saying, why are we all doing this separately and starting to share it and um, not reinvent the wheel. So um, start early, make sub plans when you are not sick. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see here. We've got some questions. Um, do you have examples of task cards for clay? That's a great question. I don't have them in like a typed out format. Like often what I'll do is I'll just take index cards and write skills that I know my kids need to work on. I mentioned the coil, um, longest coil. Uh, I also will do one that's like most uniform coil, like the same thickness. Um, I've done one, create as many spirals as you can. Um, a couple more, like I said, we do a empty bowls project in my sixth grade. So being able to do feet that are all the same size is kind of like a good skill. So rolling the same size sphere, never call them balls, not with sixth grade, roll four of the same size sphere. Um, another one is roll a coil long enough to do your name in cursive. I've done that. Um, so I don't have that in like a PDF I could share because I just kind of do it old school and write them down, but um, on the fly. But um, yeah, okay. The next question says, do you ever have kids continue a lesson or do you always use special slash separate plans for subs? Totally have them continue. This is a good question. I hadn't even thought to mention this. So like um, most of the sub plans I have, not the centers, right? But most of the sub plans that are an actual project like this marker one, I don't think they're gonna finish that next Friday. And I'll put that in the plan. I'll say to the sub, I don't expect them to finish. I expect them to do best work. Um, so then when I get back, I put all of the work in progress in here. 
And then often what I'll do is just slap a post-it note on it that says, lucky you, the kids have already started. Your job today is to help them, you know, get through the finish line. And then suddenly that same plan and same set of work is ready for the next group of kids. Um, so let's see, do we have any other Q&A? Um, oh, somebody says they love the buddy teacher idea. Yeah, it has saved me so many times. It's, it's huge. Um, so we're at 8.05. It looks like I went over just a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, so if you have uh, more questions or um, you just want to chat, um, feel free to email me. I'm also going to be at IEA next week. So come up and, and talk. Um, or if you want to email and exchange sub plans, I would love to do that too. Um, so thank you for joining me. I appreciate it and um, hope to see you at the conference.